أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام على رسول الله أمين الله على وحيه وعزائم أمره الخاتم لما سبق والفاتح لما استقبل والمهيمن على ذلك كله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام على صاحب السكينة السلام على المدفون بالمدينة السلام على المنصور المؤيد السلام على أبي القاسم محمد ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم When we talk about the messenger of God his last prophet to mankind we're talking about a man who has been promised by previous messengers and apostles to their people as a person who would emerge towards the end of time to complete all of God's revelations, to present to mankind the message that suits the people of the end of days, people have developed and they've come a long way. And so those who lived in the time of Moses differ from those who live in the modern time. Those who lived in the time of Noah and those who lived in the, in the time of Abraham obviously have a different mental capacity than those who live in this day and age. And so the revelations of God had to come in different stages so that people's mental capacities and people's ability to digest the revelation of God would be taken into account. And yet despite that, there are consistent themes. There are themes that are very similar from one message to another, from one religion to another. But by far the most complete of God's revelations, the most perfect of his religions, is the religion of Islam, which was delivered by the Holy Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him and his immaculate household, who was promised, as I said, by su subsequent prophets and messengers. And there are hints in ancient scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Bible, as to the coming of the Prophet of Islam. And this is the subject of this talk. I'd like to share with you some of those uh, scriptures and some of those hints and references that have been made in the uh, scriptures of the previous religion. So for instance, in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon 5, verse number 16, re we read as follows, Hekko mam taqim, we kollo muhammadim, ze daudi wa ze rai benoto Yerushalim. What this translates as is quite interesting. So you have different translations, of course, and each uh, translation will have a different take as to the exact literal meaning of these, of these words in ancient Hebrew. But let's go through them word by word. Hekkomam takim, which means his mouth is sweetness. Wekollo, wekollo, those who understand Arabic will know, it means, and he is all together. Wekollo, Muhammadim. Muhammad obviously is the name of the Messenger of Allah the promised Messiah, the prophet of Islam. But obviously it's a name that has a meaning. And the meaning of that name is, uh, there are many meanings that have been ascribed to it, but one of them is the praiseworthy one, the beloved. But the way this Song of Solomon 5.16 has been translated is this, he is altogether lovely. Now, whether you say that this is an actual name and that it's unclear 
It's a clear and unequivocal reference to the Messenger uh, of Allah and the Prophet of Islam. Or you try and go to the root of the word and translate it literally. That's entirely up to you. But this is what the, the Old Testament says. حِكُّمَمْ تَقِيمْ وَكُلُّ مُحَمَّدِيمْ ذِ دَوُدِّي ذِ meaning he is Dawuddi, he is my friend. Wood, again, it's a common word in Arabic and Hebrew, meaning love and, and passion. He is my beloved. Wazih Ra'i, and he is my friend. Benot Yerushalim, daughters of Jerusalem. So it's a song, it's a hymn that is recited. And again, uh, we believe it's a clear reference to the messenger. Of Allah. In Deuteronomy 33, verse number 2, again in the Old Testament, it says the following He said, The Lord came, came from Sinai and dawned over them from Sair. Sinai, of course, being the desert in Egypt, dawned over them from Sair, which is a mountain, a mountaintop in that desert. The Lord came and dawned upon the people from Mount Sair in Sinai. And then it says, Deuteronomy 33, verse number 2, He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Mount Paran or Mount Faran. The biblical scholars have actually struggled to try and locate the mountain that's been referred to in this verse in Deuteronomy 33.2. And so there's been a lot of speculation and a lot of conjecture, but we know for a fact, if we refer to old manuscripts and uh, to ancient names uh, in, uh, uh, in those lands and that part of the world, there is no such mountain to be found anywhere in Egypt. There is no such mountain to be found anywhere in biblical Israel. There's no such mountain to be found anywhere except one place. And that is the city of Mecca, the birthplace of Islam. The cradle of this religion, where the holy messenger of God and his final prophet was born. Mount Faran or Paran is the holy city of Mecca, where he shone forth from, as the Old Testament says. He came with myriads of holy ones. Holy ones. Who are these holy ones? Keep that thought. We'll get back to it later on. The holy ones that'll come along with uh, the, the person who shines forth from Mount Faran. In the Holy Quran, there's a verse. In that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually tells us that the messenger has been promised by previous prophets to their people over and over and over again. He was promised as the one who is going to come to complete this religion and therefore he's familiar. There's a sense of familiarity with the messenger of God. People can relate to him. People find him accessible which probably explains why Islam is such um, a, a fast-growing religion. Some statistics suggest that it's the fastest-growing religion in the world. But even if it's not, it's a very fast-growing religion because of that sense of familiarity that you find with it. You can immediately connect to the Messenger of God about whom we shall talk in subsequent episodes. But in this episode, what we're trying to do is to connect the dots and find these subtle hints and these, um, these reminders and, and promises and references in, in, in ancient scriptures, uh, as, we, as we have said. The verse in the Quran says the following, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, it doesn't mean that he didn't have the ability to write and read. He was just unlettered. He was untaught. He never went to school. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, 
in the law and in the gospel, meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament. For he commands them what is just and forbids them what is evil. يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم إصرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم. He commands them what is just. Again, very familiar. He's only completing the message. He's not, he's not changing it. He's not replacing it. He's completing it. He's perfecting it. Commands them what is just, forbids them from what is evil. He allows them as lawful what is good and pure. Prohibits them from what is bad and impure. He releases them from their heavy burdens. Again, think the Old Testament. Think the law. Think of all the, uh, uh, the, the jurisprudential injunctions that have been made in the Torah and the Talmud and the ancient scriptures which are debilitating in nature. One of the things that Christ Christians do today is that they simply forego the, 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 the Old Testament. As a Christian, you're unable well, maybe not un unable, but it's, it's extremely difficult for you to abide by the laws of the Old Testament. I mean, think about it. You'd have to keep the Sabbath, for instance. The whole world would come to a standstill every single Saturday because that's what it says in the Bible. And in fact, it says in the Old Testament that if you do not keep the Sabbath, you are to be killed. If you don't honor the holiday that is mandatory every single Saturday, you are to be executed. There's no ifs and buts about it. And so it's very difficult to abide by the law. And so one of the things that the, our holy messenger, the Prophet of Islam did, one of the beauties of this religion is that it came to keep up with modern times. It came to replace those old laws that, that had their you know, relevance and they were practical and they were useful and they were uh, uh, necessary for a specific period of time when, when the Israelites were uh, inhabiting the land and Moses was their prophet, but not anymore. They've run their course. These laws, most of them, they have, uh, they're expired now. Not all of them, of course. There are things that are time-honored, uh, not committing adultery, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, lusting over someone's wife and all these injunctions, these commandments, they're still as relevant as ever. But many of the, of the laws that you'll find in the, in the Old Testament and the Talmud um, are in fact uh, 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 replaced with new ones. And so the Quran says that the, this messenger, what he does is the following. He releases them from their heavy burdens and from the yokes that are upon them. So it is those who believe in him, honor him, help him and follow the light which is sent down to uh, sent down with him it is they who will prosper whether you're jewish or christian or anyone else if you follow this prophet you shall prosper both in this world as well as the hereafter there's another verse in the quran which is interesting allah says wa qala isa ibn maryam ya bani israel remember jesus the son of mary who said o children of israel I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, confirming the law which came before me and giving glad tidings of the messenger to come after me. In other words, I came to confirm the law of Moses. So I'm not replacing it. I'm not, you know, changing it. But there are, you know, adjustments that have to be made. And also, one of my primary roles and functions, and this is what's really interesting, is to give you glad tidings of the messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. His name will be Ahmed. But when he came to them with clear signs, God says in the Quran, they said, this is evident sorcery. They wouldn't accept it. So who is this Ahmad? Who is this Nabi? Who is this prophet that Jesus glad tidings about? Well, let's go to the, the New Testament. Let's go to the Bible. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. He says as follows, I will ask the Father, meaning God, 
and he will give you another comforter that he may be with you forever. Jesus is asking God for a comforter. Clearly, he's not talking about himself because he says another comforter. And this comforter will come and he will be with you forever. So if the comforter isn't Jesus, who is he? Well, some have speculated that he might be the Holy Spirit, but we beg to differ. Why is the comforter not the Holy Spirit? Well, let me take you to John uh, chapter 16, verse number 7. He says, and I quote, But very, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. So Jesus is telling the disciples that he's going away. By the way, he's not saying he'll be crucified or, or he'll be killed. He's simply going away, which is the Muslim belief uh, of, of the events that transpired uh, later on. So he says, let me go back to the verse. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. It's for your own good. Unless I go away, this is the reason, unless I go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the Comforter is someone or something that will come after Jesus is gone, meaning that it's not the, uh, the Holy Spirit as some people have suggested because the Holy Spirit has always been there. The Holy Spirit was there when Jesus was there and the Holy Spirit is there even after Jesus' departure. So who is the comforter? Well, the Greek word used for comforter is parakletus. And parakletus translates more accurately as one called to the side of. Parakletus, the one called to the side of. Nebi, the Arabic word for prophet, for messenger, uh, and Hebrew, by the way, in both Ar Arabic and Hebrew, the word for prophet is Nebi. And what it literally, tra literally translates as is one who is called. So Paracletus is one who is called to the side of. Nebi is the one who is called. We know for a fact that even without these references to the prophet of Islam in the Old and the New Testaments, even if we didn't have any of these. If you're a Jew or a Christian, all you need to do is read about the prophet of Islam, the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and you'll find the parallels, the commonalities, the resemblance between him and Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all the previous prophets is simply astonishing. He calls for the same thing. He invites to the same thing. He invokes our intellect. He reminds us of the blessings of the blessings of God. And he allows us to rediscover our humanity and our position in this world. Let me end with one more verse in the Bible where it talks about um, the Ishmael and his descendants. Of course, we know that Isaac is the forefather of uh, the Hebrew people, uh, the Jews, while his brother Ishmael is the father of modern-day Arabs and uh, the holy prophet of Islam as well. So in Genesis chapter 17, verse number 20, it says as follows, As for Ishmael, God is the one speaking, As for Ishmael, I will bless him. I will bless him also, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants, he will become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. The question is, we know Ishmael, who are the, the 12 princes and the 12 kings that will come from the descendants of Ishmael? As believers in Islam, as people who subscribe to the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, we know for a fact that the 12 princes that will come from the descendants of Ishmael are the 12 Imams, the divinely inspired and immaculate descendants of the Holy Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad, in other words, his holy household. 12 leaders that have been promised in Sunni as well as Shia references. This verse is what is 
actually made a lot of people convert to the religion of Islam. I have seen a sister who was a Christian and she says that I was reading the Bible and when it came to this verse, I, I simply couldn't find a way to explain it other than to submit to the Ahlul Bayt school of thought. Thank you very much and join me next time for another discussion of the life and the teachings and the morals of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.